JCPO loud and clear. Great. We'll start this off with a question from Twitter. It's probably for you, Chris. It's from Rick. When they opened the hatch, did Dragon have that new car smell? It absolutely did. In fact, there was a little bit of, of space smell in the vestibule. And then when we got uh, that hatch open, you could tell it was a brand new vehicle with uh, smiley faces on the other side, smiley face on mine, just as if uh, you had bought a new car, the same kind of reaction. Wonderful to see my friends and wonderful to see a brand new vehicle. All right, we'll start off with a question from Bill Harwood, CBS. Let's start off with a question from Bill Harwood, CBS. Hey, can you hear me now? Testing one, two, could you guys hear me now? I'm clear, Bill. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I just want to go back to what Bob was saying yesterday, describing the ride uphill. Uh, you were comparing it a little bit to shuttle. I was more interested in how did the first stage of the Falcon 9 feel compared to the shuttle when it was on solid? How did the second stage feel? Uh, you, you made it sound like maybe it was a little rougher than the shuttle on the main engines. Uh, and just wondering if there was ever a point in there when you looked over at Doug and went, wow, this isn't quite what I was expecting. Well, Bill, you took the words right out of our mouth. The uh, summary from uh, yesterday was good, uh, smoother uh, first stage, a little rougher second stage than we saw on shuttle and that I think both of us were expecting. We did actually comment on it uh, while we were going uphill. I think we tried to verbalize as much of the new experiences we were having just to make sure they were for real between the two of us. We were sensing the same things. All right, let's go to a question from Stephen Clark. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, what was the sensation at Nico and at stage separation since that's something that was not experienced really during shuttle to shut down the engines and then ignite a new engine in flight? And also curious about how your experiences were with the spacesuits in flight. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the question was uh, about the difference with uh, staging between the space shuttle and the Dragon since we didn't shut down the main engines on the space shuttle uh, like we went through for first stage and second stage. There was a significant difference between the solid rocket boosters on the shuttle and that second stage and so I think we all definitely felt that separation and heard the clunk associated with it. Uh, Doug and I both uh, commented on, I think Doug commented on it first, that uh, we did feel some uh, early zero G when we came off of the first stage and uh, we're getting ready to transition to the uh, second stage and then we felt that uh, second stage uh, light and I think the the uh, next question was about the suits and let uh, Doug if you want to talk a little bit about our experience with the suits yeah the suits in general Bob and I have had a uh, ton of time in those suits I bet you we've donned and doffed those suits uh, a couple hundred times so uh, the suits themselves, uh, if you're not familiar with them, they're custom designed and custom fitted, so they're very comfortable. Uh, they were actually much easier to get in and out of in zero G as we figured out over the course of the two days. And uh, yeah, I, the, we uh, complimented the suit team. Those things worked uh, very well uh, and everything we expected uh, going uphill. Lauren Grush, The Verge. Is there any, perhaps, feedback for SpaceX and NASA that you have about any potential changes that you would make for the next cruise you fly on Crew Dragon? Were there any changes that we would make? I think uh, it was your question. I, I don't yeah, I think, uh, think that there's updated. anything. We're not hearing you, Lauren. Let's uh, move on to Roseanne Aragon. Hi, for taking my question. I'm glad to see you all are well up there. Um, as you know, Houston is the home to manned space flight, and in many ways, uh, the people here who know you personally from Timber Grove, Clear Lake, 
those who've watched from Nassau Bay, Webster, you know, seen you train and your journey uh, to, to get where you're at today. Um, some of them may be like your sons who are younger and, and may be inspired by the things that you all are doing. What is your message to those who are watching from um, from Houston, um, from all of these areas in Space City? What's your message to them? Well, I think uh, my first thing I would say about that is, you know, just never quit what you're doing. This is this was an extremely long road for Bob and I. We last flew in 2010 and 2011, and then when NASA stopped flying shuttles, that was uh, in the middle of 2011, and it's just taken that hard work and dedication over the last nine, almost nine years to get us where we're at now, back in uh, launching rockets from the United States, back at space station, docking to the front of space station where shuttle used to dock. And I would just say, take a message from NASA in that anything is possible. You know, we've had a, a really rough couple of months and just to be able to, to show the country uh, what the agency's made of, what the commercial crew program did and what SpaceX did, I hope they take some uh, pride and uh, a sense of accomplishment of seeing that. I think uh, for both of us also, the Houston area uh, is where we call home now. And it certainly is true that uh, the home of Johnson Space Center, the home of human space flight, takes seriously that uh, that's our home. That is that the home of human space flight. We have excellent support there. I had uh, a parade of uh, appropriately, interestingly, social distancing individuals lining my neighborhood uh, in the half mile or so as I uh, departed on my way to the Ellington Field to head down to Florida. And I know that I just had wonderful support. And I'm, I, to all our friends and families at home, uh, thank you guys for everything. And uh, we just uh, couldn't have done it without all of you. Thank you so much. I know that probably means so much to them. Godspeed. Let's go to a question from Chris Davenport. Hey, guys. It's Chris Davenport from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking the time, and congrats on your flight. And I'll try not to leave you hanging this time. Um, to follow up on Bill and Stephen's question about the ride, I wonder if you can walk us through, you know, some of the technological differences between shuttle uh, that led to the difference in the experiences, and then maybe a little bit more of what were some of the key moments during the ascent phase that stood out to you guys. Thank you. Hey, Chris, good to talk with you. Um, I think just generically, the Falcon 9 is a liquid-fueled rocket. Remember, shuttle had solid rocket boosters to start with. Those burned very rough for the first two and a half minutes. The first stage with Falcon 9 were the nine Merlin engines in roughly the same amount of time, and it was a much smoother ride, obviously, because it was a liquid engine uh, ascent at that point. Where the difference started for, I think, both Bob and I, and we commented on it uh, at the moment, was at staging, and it was very similar to what you saw in the Apollo 13 uh, movie, where they staged from first to second stage. So the first stage engine shut off, and then it takes a second, almost a second, might, might have been less than that, but it seemed like it took, took some time between the uh, booster separating and then the Merlin vacuum engine starting. And so at that point, we go from roughly three Gs to zero Gs for, I don't know, half a second probably. And then when that Merlin vacuum engine fires, then we uh, start accelerating again uh, for the next five, six minutes until we uh, achieve orbit. So totally different than shuttle. Uh, you know, it was smooth. It got a little rougher, as Bob had mentioned before, with the Merlin vacuum engine. And, and, and it'll be interesting to talk to the SpaceX folks to find out why it was a little bit rougher ride on second stage than it was for shuttle on those three main engines. All right, let's try Marsha Dunn from the Associated Press. Hey, Doug, uh, good to see everybody up there. Um, I'm wondering, have you captured the flag yet? Have you actually put your hands on it? Is it aboard Dragon? Uh, and what are your thoughts about 
uh, laying claim to that flag since you are one of the ones who put it there nine long years ago. Thanks a lot. Hey, Marsha. Um, the short answer is Chris had it right on the hatch where we left it nine years ago. And uh, it's right here. And I think he's got a note, do not forget to take uh, with Crew Dragon. So uh, depending on how long we stay up here, can, uh, you can bet we will take it with us when we depart back to Earth. Um, from that standpoint, I think, you know, we have talked about this uh, flag before many times over the last uh, nine years since we left it here on SGS-135. And I think the important point is, is, as I said before, just returning launch capability to the United States to and from the International Space Station. And uh, that's what this flag really means. And and I think a little bit more, it's it's to the thousands of people that made it possible from the folks at SpaceX to the folks at NASA to the folks within the commercial crew program. And we just are lucky enough to be able to take it home with us. And uh, that'll be our plan here in a month or two or three or four, depending on what, uh, as Bob says, what Uncle Kirk lets us do. Let's go to a question from Mark Corot, Aviation Week. Uh, Mark Corot, Aviation Week. Uh, my question is for Chris uh, Cassidy. From, from your perspective, what skills and ISS training do uh, Doug and Bob bring to the ISS mix, especially now? And how will those help to ramp up operations internally and perhaps externally in the coming weeks? Well, you know, uh, experience goes a long way, and uh, both these guys this is their third flight, and, and so it really doesn't matter, in, in my opinion, shuttle flight experience or station flight experience. It's all has to do with working in space, working efficiently, understanding the the system and the methodology with which we work back and forth and hand in hand with mission control. And once you understand that and grasp all those concepts, the work part is, I don't want to say easy, but uh, it just kind of happens together. And and we've already seen that. Today is day one, and and, uh, and they're hitting the ground running, unloading the vehicle, and, and we've got uh, HTV right at our feet, and we'll be working in, in there in very short order, probably after we hang up from this, this conversation. Together, the three of us will be um, tackling the overall mission of, of the space station, which is conducting science, enabling that science with uh, maintaining the space station, and then there's some operational objectives sprinkled in the mix. At some point, we'll get a, a plan for uh, potential spacewalks, and, uh, and we'll execute all that. Um, we don't just sit up here at dinner and decide when all those activities are going to be done. The prioritization is done in Houston, and, uh, and then we execute the plan. So the three of us are pretty excited to get after it together. Joy Roulette with Reuters. Hey, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, I was wondering, so since you guys made it to the space station, um, how does it feel, I guess, not knowing how long you guys are going to stay there for? Does it feel weird? And um, I was also wondering if any time during the uh, trip to the space station, that if you guys noticed anything um, unexpected that you didn't experience during training or sims. Thanks. Well, thank you. It's a, a good question. I think uh, s several recent crews have had a little bit more uncertainty than we've had historically for how long their mission duration was going to be. But I guess maybe on the percentage scale, uh, Doug and I have a, maybe the most uncertainty because it could be relatively short or we could potentially double or triple maybe what was originally expected for us uh, just a few short months ago. And so it's a little bit strange. Uh, I'm trying to explain it to my son, uh, just six years old. And uh, from his perspective, he's just excited that we're going to get a dog when I get home. And so uh, he's accepting that uncertainty and uh, continuing to send messages to me while I'm on orbit. As far as unexpected things, while we were headed uphill, I think I said a little bit about this uh, yesterday, but the biggest differences are just dyna the dynamics that's involved, you know, the vibration, 
the experiences that we felt actually riding a, a real rocket, going through the fueling operation. That was a new experience for us. Uh, as you probably know, the space shuttle was fueled when the astronauts arrived. Doug and I went through the fueling operation on board Dragon, which was different from us. And so going through the, the hearing the venting and the valve sounds and the little vibrations associated with that operation was a new experience for us. And so that was that was a little bit different than training, but nothing out of family. The team did a really great job of recording that audio during the Demo-1 mission, during the mission that was a little bit over a year ago that came to Space Station with uh, no people on board and played that back for us uh, tied to the audio. So we've heard all those sounds pretty much before. And so that was extremely helpful we have the same tool for uh, coming home and uh, look forward to seeing how well that matches up with our experience. Robert Perlman. Thank you. Um, hi, Chris, Doug, and, and Bob. Um, I, for Doug and Bob, I wonder uh, during the ascent or during your um, overnight period, was there a point where the sense of history sort of seeped in where you sort of where you allowed yourself to just consider the history that you were making, um, uh, what and were that what were those specific moments? Thanks. Uh, honestly, Robert, uh, good to talk to you. Uh, I don't know if we uh, ever reflected on it uh, over the 19-hour rendezvous. I, I mean, I think uh, you know you. You may have random thoughts going through your head every now and again, but you know, both Bob and I are uh, over the last five years been pretty focused on uh, this this mission and actually flying this mission, and I think that's really what we uh, put our entire effort mentally and physically into uh, from the time we walked out uh, of the ONC building until we uh, docked with space station, and of course we're still doing it, but. Uh, you know, was just focusing on everything we could do to make sure we did what we needed to do to make it a successful ascent and rendezvous and docking. And then also try to take in all the things that uh, the Falcon 9 and the Dragon uh, showed us, you know, the noises, the maneuvers, any any nuances, any anything that we can let other folks know to be aware of as they fly that vehicle. And I think you know, for, for me anyway, you know, the historical aspect of it uh, is, is cert certainly notable, but I think it's something to maybe consider after this mission's complete. You know, we're, we're not even uh, in any way, shape, or form halfway through the mission yet. We've just docked. We still got to do our mission here with Chris and then undock, depart, and uh, do a reentry and then a uh, landing and then a recovery. So uh, plenty of work to do. Um, and, you know, we'll probably uh, think a lot more about that uh, when the time comes. Hanukkah Whitering with space.com. Hey guys, Hanukkah Whitering here. Thanks for taking my question. This is for Bob and Doug. I'm wondering what were some of the first things that you wanted to see or do after you arrived at the space station and has it changed much since you were last there or does it still kind of feel like a second home to you? Thanks. Well, I don't want to speak for Doug on this one, but uh, one of the things I was most excited about was being able to make a phone call home, you know, with it's been a long time since I launched into orbit and I've got a little boy who got a chance to watch me do that for the first time in his life. And I just wanted to understand what his experience was and share that a little bit with him while it was still fresh in his mind. He was able to make the trip back to Houston after watching the docking from down in Florida and was pretty excited about the, the whole thing. So that was uh, wonderful for me. As far as the space station goes, I'll tell you, it, uh, it seems a lot like it did when I was here last. Uh, there is uh, quite a bit more science going on, quite a bit more equipment on some of the rack faces, especially over on the, the gym side or down in uh, Node 3. But the overall structure and layout is, uh, is very similar. Uh, we did comment yesterday about the airlock configuration. It's not as uh, clean as how Chris and I remember it from our, our shuttle experiences because that was those flights were really about the assembly of space station and the airlock was ready to go 
and we're in a different mode of operation on board Space Station right now. So I know the way Space Station works is you pretty much have to configure each specific area for the task at hand. And so the mating adapter that we docked to on the forward part of the space station was all cleared out for our arrival. All that stowage was moved around. Um, quite a bit of stowage was uh, probably repositioned for HTV's arrival from, uh, from Japan. And we'll have to do some reconfiguration in other areas as we continue to uh, conduct operations on board the space station. There's just so much going on that you, you've got more stuff than you have uh, places to just stow it without you know, fully being able to conduct the operation. Anything to add, Doug? Let's go across the pond to Jackie Goddard with The Times. Thank you. Hi, Jackie Goddard for The Times of London, and congratulations. This, message, this mission feels so much more funky and futuristic with everything from the capsules look to the touch screens, the technology, the suits. Um, does this feel like the Jetsons? Um, can you describe some of the emotion around it of the ride uphill? Um, and somebody has to ask it, that all-important question that the child in all of us needs to know, how was the Crew Dragon toilet? Thank you. Well, it's good to talk to you. Um, let me think. Uh, from a futuristic standpoint, I think, uh, you know, SpaceX uh, from the very start of that company has uh, tried to be very forward thinking and cutting edge. And uh, it is one of the factors that went into the design of the Crew Dragon and our spacesuits and everything about the vehicle. And, uh, you know, for us as uh, the, the test pilots, so to speak, um, you know, we're there to evaluate how it does the mission, and uh, so far it's done uh, just absolutely spectacularly. You know, it's, uh, it's a very clean vehicle. I think most people think it's a, a really cool-looking vehicle. Uh, I know my son thinks so, and it, it does everything we need it to do uh, for this mission, so we're very happy with that part of it. Um, let's see, the toilet. Uh, I think we had a bet to see when that question was going to be asked about Dragon, and uh, it works very similar to the uh, the one we were used to in the space shuttle, and it worked very well. We had no issues with it. All right, next is Peter King. Good morning, uh, Peter King with CBS News Radio, and I know uh, Bob and Doug that you were up there uh, to help Chris uh, overcome that shorthanded situation, but. It also gives the SpaceX people a chance to evaluate the Dragon's long-term performance during its exposure to the elements while you're up there. What are some of the things they're going to be looking for? Well, you're absolutely right that we'll put the Dragon through its paces in preparation for the Crew-1 flight. Uh, we already spent quite a bit of the day uh, preparing basically Dragon to serve its purpose as a lifeboat or an emergency departure vehicle. So Doug and I spent uh, quite a bit of time getting the equipment prepared so that that vehicle is, is ready to go and execute that mission. And we probably did a little more uh, as a part of that than other crews will do in the future. We've performed some connections with the uh, computer systems to make sure that we can configure the communication between everything from the Soyuz to the rest of the space station back to Dragon if we needed to do that from inside of our small little vehicle. And we established that that stuff all works. Um, and we'll continue to do small checkouts like that. We'll go through the process of powering down Dragon, taking it to its uh, kind of hibernate, hibernated state and then bring it back up here in just a few short days just to make sure that that process goes smoothly. Again, every crew won't need to do that sort of an evaluation, but since it's the first flight, uh, we really are putting her through her paces to make sure that any of the little aspects of the mission that it might be called upon to support, it's ready to do that. And so that's from the hibernated state, that's from a regular departure or to, you know, serve as another environment for us to go and safe haven in should we need to if there was a problem on board space station. And we'll do all those things before we call her operational and then really pick up with a primary task focused on helping Chris out on the space station side. Leo Enright with Irish Television. 
Congratulations, Bob and Doug. And as we say in Ireland, Sláin a Walia, safe home. Um, I, I have another question about launch and about something that was different this time. Your final call-out before SECO was Shannon, to which Hawthorne replied, Roger Shannon. Now, obviously, Shannon is in Ireland, uh, and I rather expect that we're going to be hearing this call-out a lot uh, in the years to come. So a lot of people in Ireland are wondering, what was that all about? Well, hello, Ireland. That's a, that's a great question. So the uh, ascent trajectory offers us some opportunities if needed, if we have got a failure with a launch vehicle to abort. And some of those scenarios involve aborting fairly close to Kennedy Space Center along the uh, east coast of the United States, all the way up towards Newfoundland even, into Canada. And then uh, once our trajectory hits a certain point and we get high enough, we are going to abort forward to uh, the UK and uh, the Ireland area specifically, and we can do that and the later stages of our powered flight before the engine shut down. So that's our call to uh, Mission Control and Hawthorne to let them know that we see that change in the abort destination if, if that eventuality is needed. Sophie Sanchez, Chicago Now. Hola from Chicago. Um, Doug, as a test pilot, what was it like for you taking control of Endeavour for the first time? And then if you can both share a little bit about the docking procedure, um, how it compared to the Soyuz docking procedure. Thank you. Flying the Dragon was uh, exactly how we expected it to be, and that was one of the reasons we wanted to do the manual flight test uh, twice. So we did it uh, shortly after we got to orbit uh, on our first day, and then when we were on the uh, final portion of the docking axis, we did it again yesterday. And it's all to prove that that capability works for future crews if, if need be. Most folks are familiar with the fact that Dragon is designed to be totally automated from the time it launches until the time it returns to Earth. But if there's any systems failures or other issues, we would like to know with confidence that if we take over manually, the, the, the vehicle will do what we, what we need it to do. Dave Mosier. Dave Mosier. Good. Oh. Thank you so much for taking my call, and uh, congratulations on your flight. It's, uh, it was amazing to watch. Um, Chris, what was your the biggest thing you, you felt or thought as Endeavor approached the ISS? And Bob and Doug, uh, same question for you. Uh, what were your, your biggest thoughts or emotions as you, as you pulled up to this, this place you haven't been in you know, many, many years? And I'm also curious, I want to ask the, the spacesuit question a different way. What's your five-star review? Well, what would you rate it? What would you say about the spacesuits and your, uh, if you had to review them online? Thank you. I'll take the first part of that, that question from the space station side of things. What was going through my mind while they were, uh, well, there's sort of several phases. One was during launch, and uh, that was quite exciting for the three of us on board. We flew directly over the Kennedy Space Center two minutes before launch, got some nice pictures of the launch pad. We were out over the ocean at the time of engine ignition, so we couldn't quite see. Plus, we were in the day, and KSC was in the day, so we didn't see the actual launch. But that was very, very exciting, and the three of us were, were, uh, were just cheering just much like you were, I'm sure. Fast forward to, to yesterday when uh, we were watching the vehicle do its uh, stair-step maneuver up to our altitude, and Yvonne and I uh, could see, we were looking out the cupola window, we saw it very far away, about 19, 20 kilometers, and then it got brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger, and uh, and it struck me that that little tiny dot was going to be fixed to a, a piece of metal that was about 15 meters from where I was looking, where I was standing, so to speak. And um, and then they came up to our same altitude and started coming directly in on the docking axis. And I had the camera out at one particular point, um, and I cracked open the window to get a picture, and I realized that inside that spacecraft were two of my colleagues and friends, and they're going 17,500 miles an hour, and we're going 17,500 miles an hour, and we are bringing these two vehicles together 
uh, with a computer and them backing it up and, and I could monitor this process on the telemetry. And so from a technical nature, I was pretty amazed at the whole thing, just realizing what was happening. But then uh, you fold into that the historic aspect of the whole day and what it means to America, what it means to our nation's space program, what it means to international cooperation and commercial cooperation. It just was kind of awe-inspiring, to be honest with you. And then uh, that was a fleeting moment We're back to the operations, uh, but it was, it was a pretty impressive day, and I'm just honored to be a part of it. As far as the docking was concerned, um, Dragon flew pretty similar to shuttle. It had very similar characteristics. The automation would have made the, or did make the same corrections that I think either Bob or I would have as we were coming in. And the thing that really stood out to both of us, and we mentioned it as soon as we docked, is we didn't feel the docking. It was just so smooth, and then we were docked, which uh, in shuttle you felt a little bit of a jolt, nothing real heavy, but you felt it. And we asked uh, the guys on board station the same question, and they said we didn't feel it either, which is typical, more typical. But anyway, that really, really surprised me. So that either just the velocities or the, uh, the, the strength of the docking mechanism really absorbed any, any, any uh, inertia as we came into dock. And it was pretty neat that we couldn't feel anything at all on board Endeavor. I think uh, for both Doug and I, we'd have to give the suits a uh, five-star rating. You know, each suit is is point designed for a very specific mission. This one is point designed for us to sit in our seats and protect protect us if there's a fire or any sort of a problem with the atmosphere on board Dragon. It's leaking out or has smoke in it or anything like that. And so, uh, these suits that didn't have to do that job for us, uh, which was nice. But it was clear that they were ready. Uh, we had a great uh, checks of the suits as we as we continued uphill and pre-launch and I just can't say enough about the the SpaceX team uh, Chris Trigg uh, Eric Maria and and all the other members of that team have just done an outstanding job supporting us getting them tailor fit to, to fit on us and uh, we look forward to seeing how they perform Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. And that concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. Thank you to all participants from JSC, PAO, and the media station. We are now resuming operational audio communications. Thank you.